The screen in the main room was blowing a news story about humans again, but the only member of the Kolfgolders family that was paying any attention was the daughter, Honor. Honor was 16 years old and nearing the end of her final year of compulsory school. The news was just another filler bit about some group of humans on shore leave, getting a little wild and damaging an entertainment establishment before being rounded up by more humans in black armour and dragged back off planet. It happened every few weeks, ever since, five or so years ago, the humans appeared out of the black and set up a forward logistics base among the outer planets. The Koblenz only barely had interplanetary travel capability, and were a long way from interstellar travel, so when the humans moved in, the Koblenz had little choice but to say, yes sir. But, to their credit, the humans seemed to be at least trying to be good neighbours. They set up a few embassies around the planet, including one just an hour away, did their best to police their sailors, and otherwise pretty much left the Koblenz alone. Honor wasn't paying attention to the content of the news. She was drawing the humans that the story was about. Humans and Koblenz had very similar bodily structures overall, but Honor was struggling to draw their hands. Palm up, human hands had five digits in a 140 arrangement. One digit sticking out of the palm away from the center of the body, four digits sticking out of the palm opposite the wrist, and nothing on the body center side. Each digit had three joints. Honor had many times drawn Koblenz hands with their 404 arrangement of four joint digits, and one human hands be strange and rather limited in their dexterity. She looked over at her much younger brother Hod, and briefly wondered how human children could count on their fingers with so few of them. It didn't occur to her that humans counted in base 10 instead of base 16. Honor's artistic skills were held by her mother, Yose, a teacher of music and visual arts at the local early age compulsory school. Honor's math and science skills were relentlessly drilled into her by her father, Beersel. Beersel was a physics professor at the local university, and he was coming up in his tenure review. He was currently sitting at his desk behind Honor in the main room, going over a presentation he would be making in the morning. Honor dreamed of being an engineer or an astronaut or something of that nature, but was having trouble finding a university that would accept her. All of the good technical universities, including the one her father worked at, were male only. Cobbling culture was limiting in that respect. Morning came, and Professor Beersel Kovgodas gave his talk on the relationship between energy and wavelength for a body in thermodynamic equilibrium. It was a disaster. Professor Mond, the head of the physics department, slammed the table he was sitting at. Professor Kovgodas, we've heard this nonsense before. Your theories depend on a constant that implies that there is a minimum discrete value of energy. I've told you before, that is absurd. Obviously, energy is a continuous value that can be cut in half indefinitely. What's next? Are you going to tell me that there is some discrete minimum value for momentum? What about gravity? Hell, why not time itself? Tenure is denied, and at the end of the semester, this institution no longer has need of your services. It was still early in the day when Beersel found himself in an off-campus bar nursing some strong ethanol, the print out of his paper on the bar beside him. He only pulled himself out of his glass to notice his surroundings when a hand picked up his paper. A hand with five digits. The human caressed the paper and said, I like it. I liked your presentation of it. Perhaps you are at the wrong college for this sort of thing. If you are interested in teaching and learning at a college where what humans call, he caressed the paper again, quantum mechanics is appreciated, Come visit me. Then the human was gone. On the bar were Beersel's paper and a business card for John Anderson, Special Skills Liaison Recruiting Office, and in the dress of the human embassy. It was lunchtime, and Jose Kovgoldas decided to eat lunch outside of her classroom for once. As she sat in a small diner eating an overpriced sandwich and sipping tea, she read the bulletin again. Budget cuts were forcing the school to end its non-essential music and visual arts program for all elementary age students. Non-essential? And yet the government can find money to repaint all the public trash cans that look like flower pots as long as the right friend of a friend gets a kickback? At the end of the semester, she'll be out of a job. In as she was, she didn't notice when the background noise dropped considerably. It wasn't until a shadow fell across her table that she looked up into the eyes of a human. A layoff notice. A lot of that going around today, said the human. Goblin music is very different from human music. For example, where we have an 8 note scale, you have a 16 note scale. The principles of composition in your visual arts are similarly unusual. Have you considered taking a sabbatical to learn about human art and teach humans about goblin art? Think about it. Here's my card. As the human smiled and left, Jose realized that everybody else in the diner was silently staring at her. She looked down at the card in her hand. John Anderson, Special Skills Liaison Recruiting Office. 
It was the afternoon recess, and Hodge Kovkogas was sitting on a bench where the teaching assistants had placed him. With his paralyzed legs, recess was just boredom and humiliation. The teaching assistants could not comprehend, no matter how many times he told them, that he did not enjoy watching the biggest kids in the class play pushball. Why would he want to watch two teams line up facing each other, and then push into each other, hoping to carry a ball four more body lengths in four plays or less? He didn't have functioning legs. Those same kids loved to call him a freak and push him in the hallways when they passed. It wasn't until both teams stopped moving, got quiet and stared at him, that Hod realised he was not alone. An adult human male sat down next to him. You know, Hod, the human said, where I'm from, people without legs can still get around and do things. I hear you are the top of your class in math and reading. That just makes the pushy kids push me more, said Hod. It makes them mad that I'm better than them or something. There was once a human named Franklin Roosevelt that was paralysed like you. He became the leader of the most powerful nation on my home world in a time of war. There was another man named Stephen Hawking who also could not use his legs. He became a physicist like your father. If we can't fix your legs, we can at least provide machines that make your legs less of a problem, and an environment where you are respected and not pushed. Keep those thoughts in mind and be open-minded if your parents suggest a change of scenery, okay? The human patted Hodge's shoulder and got up. As he was walking away, he turned and said, Oh, my name is John. Take care. The last period of the day featured a calculus test. Honor completed it with 20 minutes to spare, but the rule said she had to sit quietly until the end. She turned to the blank back page and started doodling. Finally, the end of period signal chirped, and everybody passed their test forward. When the test got to the front, that jerk Harkel snatched her test out of the stack and waved it around showing everybody the doodles and making mocking comments about Honor wanting to be an astronaut. The mocking didn't even stop after they exited the classroom. Harkel and three of his friends grabbed Honor's heavily doodled on notebook and, holding it up while running backward, called Honor all manner of unfeminine names. Suddenly, a new hand clasped the notebook. All four boys turned around, went instantly quiet, and then spread apart from the owner of the new hand like they had just seen death himself. The human thumbed through the notebook, looking at the drawings in amongst the class notes, and then, closing the notebook as he did so, started walking towards Honor. So, Miss Kofkadaz, you like to draw spacecraft and sometimes humans. When he got close enough, he held Honor's notebook out to her and said, Did you know that we have both males and females at all ranks of our space fleet, starting with our space fleet academy? Do you have female cobblins in your space fleet? Not yet. Someone has to be brave enough to be the first to apply. Honor stared at the human in disbelief. How did you know my name? It's what I do, the human said. I understand you're still thinking about where to go for your advanced education studies. Here's my card. Think it over. Honor stared at the back of the human until he passed out of sight. John Anderson, Special Skills Liaison Recruiting Office. Having missed the bus, Honor started the long walk home, lost in her thoughts. Dinner started out pretty quiet at the Kovgodas home. Everybody had something to say and nobody quite knew how to start. Finally, Yosei asked Beersel how his tenure presentation went. He said quietly, They are dismissing me at the end of the semester. Yosei replied, They are laying me off and shutting down my department at the end of the semester. The room was silent again until Yosei said, Maybe we should try, um, somewhere else. Beersel looked at her, a uh, man named Anderson offered me a job. Honor pulled a small card out of her pocket. John Anderson? Hort piped in. John's nice. He said they could do something to help me move around on my own. Everybody looked at Hort, and then Yosei pulled out her small card and said, John Anderson gets around. The next day, everybody skipped their scheduled appointments by claiming family emergency, and a Kovkata's family piled into their vehicle and headed for the human embassy. When they got there and showed the guards John's card, Hob was thrilled that the first thing they did was produce a powered wheelchair and show him how to use the joystick control to drive it. They even let him run it at top speed around the limousine loop to get the feel of the chair. Then, as the family was led through the building to Mr. Anderson's office, it was not lost on your say that the entire building was constructed in such a way as to allow the chair to travel through it. In contrast, Coblin architecture tended to favour steps and curbs everywhere under the theory that differences in elevation allow important people to select good vantage points, either to see or be seen. It was a long and tiring day. There were many details to be worked out and many forms to sign, but at the end of it, everything was finalised. At the end of the current school semester, the Kovgadas family was emigrating to Earth. 
Dear Self finally asked the question that everybody, well, everybody but young Hod was thinking. Why? I have no doubt our family will benefit tremendously from this, but why are you humans footing the bill? What do you get out of this? Mr. Anderson sat back. We have found that if we just pop in on a new species and dump a bunch of technology onto them, it crashes their economy. If we try to make social changes like equal civil rights for all independent of gender or caste, we get reactionary pushback and civil unrest. If we try to impose a united planetary government, it's the same story. Any sudden change imposed from the outside will destabilize society. So now we take a different approach. Over time, we identify promising families and integrate them as a family into our societies and systems. As more and more Coblins get used to living and working with humans and the other alien species that we have already integrated with, Coblins as a whole will start developing a multi-species mindset. As more and more Coblins learn our science and technology from the comforting perspective of it being our technology, they will start to get comfortable with it being their technology too. In a few years, your ideas on thermodynamics, for instance, will no longer be seen as radical. When human art and Coblin art start borrowing from each other, that too helps build the multi-species mindset. When Ossa returns as the captain of her own starship, Coblin attitudes about their win will slowly change. And when Coblin see Hod being self-sufficient in his wheelchair, attitudes about Coblins with disabilities will change. In short, rather than uplifting your people from the outside, we help you uplift your people from the inside, one family at a time, until very soon, Coblins, humans, and all the other species we have contacted are joined together in one big multi-species family. As you know, the facilities we have built in your outer system are a forward logistics base supporting our fleets. You may not have thought about exactly what that means. We are part of a coalition of species that is in a large and protracted war with another coalition of species. That other coalition has a very different philosophy about social organization. In times like these, friends are the most important resource in the galaxy, and I am here to make some.